Good evening, and let's pray some more. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gospel, this living word of yours that brings us to Jesus Christ, your Son. Help us, we pray, by the work of your Holy Spirit, to meet with Jesus now and to learn more of what it means to put our faith in him. In his name we pray. Amen. Page 838 in the Bibles is where we need to be for this next part of uh, Mark's Gospel. So if you've closed that, do please open it up again. Page 838, we're looking at Mark chapter 2, verse 23, down to Mark 3, verse 6, and the two incidents recorded there. And I've called this Confronting Jesus. And as I was thinking about this, two things came to my mind. The first was a musical, Les Miserables. I don't know if you know it. Apparently, over 130 million people have seen it in 53 countries and 438 cities in 22 languages, and it is the longest-running musical in the world. Uh, one of my daughters is, is quite close to being a super fan, so I've seen it multiple times. And at the center of it, are two contrasting characters who are in a long-running and ultimately fatal conflict. One of them is the police inspector Javert, a self-righteous man with an obsession for enforcing the law as he understood it. The other is the thief and convict Jean Valjean, repentant and saved by grace. As my daughter always says, Javert doesn't get grace. And he comes to hate Valjean with a passion. Watch it uh, for yourself if you don't know the story and you want to know what happens. The other thing that came to my mind was a question. I asked it of myself, and now I'm going to ask it of you. Is your heart full of self-righteous hatred or is it grace-filled and at rest? Maybe a bit of both. I found that a searching and uncomfortable question for myself because there is stuff that goes on in my heart that I wish was not there. Maybe there is in your heart too. As always, it is Jesus who gives us hope. So don't have a shriveled, hating heart. Let Jesus restore it and give you rest. Why does this section cause those thoughts? Well, let's get into it. Jesus, remember, has burst onto the scene after his baptism by John. He has been traveling around, teaching, preaching, and healing on such a scale that in the words of chapter 1, verse 28, his fame spread everywhere with the result that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town. That's chapter 1, verse 45. And people were saying, we never saw anything like this. But not everybody liked it. We're only in chapter 2, and already Jesus has been accused of blasphemy, and of keeping bad company unfit for a man of God. So things are already hotting up, and now the stakes get higher still. I have five observations, five things for us to take note of as we look at what happened here. So first of all, two confrontations take place between the Pharisees and Jesus. Here are two encounters between Jesus and the highly religious Pharisees with an obsession for enforcing their forest of traditions that had grown up around God's law in the Scriptures. Last week, we saw their concern for fasting. This week, the presenting issue is how they thought the Sabbath should be kept if the no work on the Sabbath rule was going to be followed properly. 
The first encounter is in an agricultural setting, we might say, and the second encounter was in a religious setting. So look, first of all, at chapter 2, verses 23 and 24 for the first agricultural setting. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the cornfields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck ears of corn. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now, at first, that could sound quite non-confrontational, though certainly questioning as if what they're really after is a seminar on Sabbath-keeping with Jesus, who is the new kid on the block, so they could set him right on a few things. But it quickly becomes clear that, in fact, the atmosphere between them is getting much more hostile than that. So look at the second encounter in its religious setting, there in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Again, Jesus entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. Now, it occurs to me that there is one good thing that is going on here for all the uncomfortable nature of these confrontations, and that is that the Pharisees are encountering Jesus. The stir that Jesus has created has provoked them to go to him, to watch what he and his followers are up to, and to ask him questions. And that is something we want to try and make happen in all of our own varied context. So let's encourage encounters with Jesus. Even if, even if we do feel it's going to be uncomfortable, let's take every opportunity to bring people into the orbit of the church, which is the fellowship of the followers of Jesus. Today, maybe some sparks will fly, but people need to meet with Jesus. One tool for that is the word one-to-one material that Pete's been encouraging us to try out. The whole point of that is precisely to try and get people who don't yet know or understand Jesus to meet with him in the pages of the Gospel of John and to see what happens and what questions are thrown up, hostile or otherwise. So two confrontations take place between the Pharisees and Jesus. That's the first thing. Secondly, the Sabbath was made for us. Now, there's more going on here than just questions about how to keep the Sabbath appropriately, to be sure. But nonetheless, we can be grateful that Jesus takes this opportunity to set out what we might call the Sabbath principle from which we can learn so much. It's there in verse 27 of chapter 2. And Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Pharisees' forest of Sabbath regulations was such that the Sabbath, instead of being a blessing, had become constraining and oppressive and was failing to fulfill God's purpose for it. It it was as if they had become slaves to the Sabbath. No plucking of ears of corn in a field. No helping a man with a withered hand. And Jesus challenges their whole approach to the Sabbath work-free day of rest. So, in this field, in verses 25 and 26 of chapter 2, he draws their attention to this fascinating Old Testament example in the life of David. We heard the incident being read earlier on. So here it is from verse uh, 25. And Jesus said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him. How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. Now the basic point surely is that these ritual ceremonial laws should have been applied with some flexibility when there was an urgent need. And there's another dimension here too, it seems to me. Here is David, God's anointed king, 
not yet king, but going to be king, who at the time has had to flee from King Saul, who is trying to kill him. He needs food. And David claims the right to use the holy bread, not only for himself, but also, as Jesus says, for those who were with him. So God's anointed king, the Messiah, the Christ, can do that. So it is here with Jesus, God's anointed king of kings, the Messiah, the Christ. He has every right to be flexible in his application of the Sabbath law when the need arises for him and for those who are with him. Similarly, in the second confrontation, so look at chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. And Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to kill? But they were silent. Man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was not given by God to oppress us. It was lawful to do what was necessary and what was good on the Sabbath. But the Sabbath was made for man, says Jesus. The Sabbath principle is a fantastic blessing from God to all humanity. And we should learn not to ignore it, but to apply it to our lives and indeed our culture as we can with proper flexibility, but without neglect. Ramsey was talking very helpfully to our staff team about this just the other week. And among other things, he said, we should recognize what a day of rest is for in a positive sense. And enjoy the freedom from our weekly toil to rest and worship our Creator and Redeemer. So let's be serious, sensible, and joyful about the Sabbath principle. The Sabbath was made for us. That's the second thing. Thirdly, the Pharisees reject the Word of God for the sake of their traditions. That is what is really going on here, and that's why it is so serious. It's not that the Pharisees are just a little bit too rigid in the way they're applying the Sabbath law. Rather, their forest of man-made traditions and regulations so surrounds God's law that they have lost sight of God's law altogether. All they now care about is their own regulations and man-made laws. Jesus is crystal clear about that at a later confrontation with them a few chapters further on in Mark 7. There, Jesus applies a prophecy of Isaiah to them. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And then he says to them, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he warns them that they are making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things you do. In the end, the Pharisees end up not only rejecting the word of God in the scriptures, but the word of God made flesh in the person of Jesus. That is how serious this is. So we must be very careful not to fall into the same trap. Religion can cause us to reject the living God. Can I say a word to you if you are a Muslim here this evening, perhaps interested in finding out more about Christian faith? We are so glad that you are here with us. Let me ask you a gentle question. Could it be that your religious traditions are in fact serving to block your path to Jesus, who is the Son of God who gave his life for our sins? Please don't let them 
lead you to reject him. The lesson is for every one of us. We should saturate ourselves in the scriptures, the living word of God, and submit all of our traditions to the test of its supreme authority. The Pharisees reject the word of God for the sake of their traditions. That's the third thing. Fourthly, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath and the Pharisees. Chapter 2, verses 27 and 28 in the cornfield. And Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And then in chapter 3, verse 5 in the synagogue where that man was with the withered hand. And Jesus looked round at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Do you see Jesus? Here is the divine Messiah with all authority, whose word is the command of God and whose commands are always for our good. Here is our Savior, full of compassion for the suffering of the man with the withered hand and with divine power to restore him. Here is the Lord who is angry and grieved at the hardness of heart of the Pharisees who will not listen to him and so are turning away from the only one who can save them. As Tim Keller put it, why does Jesus become angry with the religious leaders? Because the Sabbath is about restoring the diminished. It's about replenishing the drained. It's about repairing the broken. To heal the shriveled man is to do exactly what the Sabbath is all about. The Pharisees' hearts are as shriveled as the man's hand. Although they are confronting Jesus, they will not come to him. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 and 29, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. There is a sense in which Jesus is not only Lord of the Sabbath, he is the Sabbath. We find our rest in him, and that is what the Pharisees so tragically would not see. And we must be different. We must not confront Jesus with hostile intent. We must surrender ourselves to him. He understands our weariness. He knows the burdens we carry. He is gentle and lowly in heart. He is ready to give us rest. We must not harden our hearts against him and close our ears to his voice as the Pharisees did. That way lies only the withering of our souls and the anger and grief of the one who is Lord of all. Don't fight against him. Don't flee from him. We must have soft hearts, open ears that learn from him and feet that come to him and follow him and stay close to him. And then we will find rest for our souls. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath and the Pharisees, and of us, of you, and of me. That's the fourth thing. Then finally, and fifthly, the Pharisees set to work to destroy Jesus. 
Such is the hardness of their hearts. Look at chapter 3, verses 4 and 5 again, and then verse 6. And Jesus said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked round at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. This is where the real agenda of the Pharisees here is exposed for all to see. And it is really an astonishing and rapid descent into darkness across these two encounters that we've been looking at. At the start of the first, the disciples of Jesus pluck some ears of corn. That's it. That's what they do. That's all. They pluck some ears of corn. But the Pharisees' thinking is so distorted that it twists into sheer evil. And they determine to destroy the Lord who is gentle and lowly in heart. And they plan to do it in collaboration with the Herodians, irreligious compromisers with the culture and the political elite of their time. What a terrible irony that is. They have become ravenous wolves wanting to devour the Lamb of God. We live in the same world. We must not be naive. Wolves have ravaged the church in the West for a long time now, and naive believers have let it happen. We must not be under any illusions about the intentions of the wolf. The Pharisees set to work to destroy Jesus. That's the fifth thing for us to see here. But thank God that is not the end of the story. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so sorry when we grieve you. Thank you that you went to the cross to die to rescue us from the consequences of your righteous anger. Help us to hear as a word to us that word you spoke to the man with the withered hand. Come here. Thank you that you are the Lord of the Sabbath and in you we find rest for our weary and burdened souls. Soften our hearts when they are hard. Open our ears when they are closed. Help us to keep in step with your Spirit and to stay close to you. Amen.